All right, let me make some intros just to formalize this conversation, and then we're going to get really off track. So yes. The first, person, <laughs> yeah. the first person I'm going to introduce is Scott Edinger. Scott, for whatever reason, is really good friends with Jay Brunetti. So if you've li <laughs> listened to this podcast before, you know Jay's been on. He's our number two guest of all time, and he's the managing partner at Higher Alliance, a, a trusted and valued partner for companies in the staffing space. Scott, on the other hand, is an executive advisor on leading business growth. He's also the author of a book called The Growth Leader. And I encourage anyone out there who's leading a team to read this and anybody out there that wants to understand the value of sales in the growth process to read this book. So Scott, Jay, thanks for being with me today. Scott is a best-selling author. Let's let's make sure that's clear. Oh uh, yeah, right. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Jay. And that means a lot, given that you are like the Alec Baldwin of this podcast, <laughs> Saturday Night Live. Like you, I didn't really. You're the number two guest. That's, that's <laughs> number my first two. time. Not the not the current Alec Baldwin, the old Alec Baldwin. Current yeah. Well, uh, it, in terms of pure number of hosting, I think he's got like first or second on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, so. yeah. Valid point. Valid point. Yeah. So my responsibility over the next, you know, 45 minutes or so is to try to not talk over these guys. I'm going to do whatever, whatever I can to do that. But I want to yield at the beginning just because Jay and Scott have been friends for roughly 32, 33 years. Jay, why don't you just kind of bring us all up to speed on how Scott got here today and, and 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 the reason you thought it would be good for us to have a conversation. Yeah, yeah. So right, 19 summer of 1992, right, Scott? Summer of 92. Yes. We yeah. um is when we met. We both are in the same fraternity, but went to different schools. You know, Scott's a Florida State guy, I'm a UMaine guy, and we traveled uh, for our fraternity. We became regional directors, and that's how we we met in Richmond, Virginia. Way back. Yes, I, I I had a friend of mine who went on to law school who said I'm going to law school, but you were so good at being in our fraternity that you turned yeah. pro. Yeah, that's um, that right. Was, you know, we, we believed in the leadership development side of the whole thing. So, yeah, it uh, wasn't just drinking beers and partying. And I know everyone, that's what you think. But there was actually probably where we both got our first taste of what leadership looks like and, and all that kind of stuff. So, Scott, I'll let you take it from there in terms of kind of rewinding back to, you know, the beginning of uh, Scott even before school. It depends on how far we go back. I'll go back right right to that that time frame um, where you know post college. Of course, I got a communication degree and communication studies and rhetoric. And of course, with with that, it's like, what the hell do you do with that degree? And um, you know, again, c connected to the ideas of why we're here today, talking about business growth and leadership. And of course, we'll uh, uh, get into uh, all, all other facets of of life in general over the course of the conversation here, but. Uh, my fascination with leadership and developing leaders started early. Um, of course, that that takes me to wanting to write the growth leader. But at that time, I didn't know anything about the business world. Uh, I had a degree in communication studies and rhetoric, as I'd said, with that uh, beautiful degree, you can do anything. And of course, uh, that means what the hell are you going to do with that? So I had gotten all kinds of encouragement uh, to go into sales that this is a good career. But I had no desire to get into sales. I uh, I thought it was like, well, I, I wanted something that carried with it at the time. I thought, well, I want something that's more prestigious. Of course, what I've learned now is that there's this thing that researchers call sales stigma. That's around sales. It's like people don't think that uh, it's about being pushy and and making people buy things they don't want, don't need, and can't afford. That That, of course, is a theme in the growth leader that leaders have this perspective on sales that is often wrong <laughs> about what it takes to be successful. So instead of going into sales, I went into human resources. Uh, so I went like the opposite direction. Uh, and I and I remember in one of those interviews, the partner at um, Cooper's and Library at the time where I ended up getting hired was like, this part of the business works on our most important asset. And we cultivate the human capital of this business to produce. It just sounded so awesome. I was like, this sounds great. It's all connected to leadership. Human capital. Of course, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> the human capital management. It's, um, by the way, one of the sillier terms in business, I think. And, <laughs> and by the way, as a consultant, I use a lot of silly terms. But that's, a, that's a human capital management, yeah. if, you know, so. Sure, but sorry. again, managing managing people is the thing and um, and leading people and developing people 
putting them in a position to succeed. Of course, I realized like 48 hours into it that the job was administrative <laughs> and I yeah. hated it. I'm like, this <laughs> sucks. You know, so, but, uh, but I stick it out because I moved out to San Francisco on a connection, uh, wanted to do a good job. And, uh, and, and life was still pretty good at that time. So I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to learn here about a year and a half later. I'm at lunch with, uh, one of my colleagues partner in the firm had taken us out to lunch. And, uh, it was one of those reward lunches, you know, nice expense account lunches that we had in the nineties. He says, you know, the two of you did a great job for me this year. Um, main difference is that you pointing to the audit associate, you generate revenue and then you, and you pointing to me says your overhead. And and two of the three people at the table had a great laugh over that. And then I, <laughs> my job, yeah, I was the overhead. overhead. <clears throat> yeah, I want to ask you because I, you know, you uh, were on the debate team, and I'm always fascinated by the story. But how did you get into debate? How did you get into doing that? Oh well, hold on, is... hold on, hold on. Before debate, let me cut you off for a second. What what goes on in your mind, Jay? You're going to go back to that question in a second. What goes on in your mind when somebody tells you you're overhead? Me or <laughs> Scott? Scott. <laughs> Oh, well, what, what, I, what I heard there was um, there's a major difference in the value you provide for this business, and it's not even close. And of, of course, it wasn't the first time I'd heard that, but it stung when I heard it this way. So that's when I started realizing, I was like, oh, this sales thing, uh, generating revenue, th that might actually be kind of important <laughs> for businesses. Yeah. That's, that's actually, I could say that's the moment the growth leader was born. Um, when, you know, back in 1996 or something in that, in that time frame, So it's like, wow, the, the, the whole sales stigma thing, um, that I had had. And that, by the way, still 30 plus years later, lots of people don't have the right idea about what it takes. Um, the thing that goes through your mind is like, wow, there's a lot more value here than I have thought about and being overhead not so much of a value contributor to an organization, not that it's not useful or not important, but sort of like electricity. It's like you need it, but is it really valuable on a day-to-day -day basis for a business? Can you get it kind of as commodity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one more yeah. question, and Jay, we'll get into the rhetoric, but one more question on that. Your book is really about the intersection between leadership and sales and the value of having sales at the table. Oftentimes, though, the leadership teams have no idea what sales is all about, and yet they have an expectation of that sales team. I'm wondering when that person sat with you back then, are they questioning their own value? So I want to make sure I answer your question right here too, Dave. But when leaders think about sales, it's not that executives don't think that sales isn't important at all, right? It's not that at all. It's that they don't think of it. They, of course, it keeps the lights on. It's everything. But they don't think of it as strategic. Yeah. And it's like, oh, just just go do it. It's ex just execute. Go, you know, play golf, have dinner, be right. be personable, wear the lampshade, and and then bring back orders <laughs> or something. But your but but your question was those leaders. How much are they thinking about themselves as overhead? Yeah. Or did I miss yeah. that? Yeah. Well, yeah, because I, you know when I read it, I was thinking about how often the folks at the top are disconnected from the customer but they have an expectation that the sales team will just figure it out and generate the revenue and make everything okay. Yeah. And in your situation back during that meeting at lunch, somebody decided yeah. to tell you you're overhead. Oh yeah. I, want, I wonder if indirectly they were thinking of themselves as overhead as well. Just, I'm just curious. A little bit of a projection. I think this yeah. is me and yeah, I think that, um, well, I think all three of us have talked with leaders who have their own, you know, concerns. How, how much value do I create for this entity? Right? Yep. I mean, I, I see that all the time that, um, you know, the, the code for that is imposter syndrome. It's like, how much, how much am I doing here? That's really valuable. And how much is it overhead? I think that's a, frankly, a, a healthy question to be asking. And I'd be surprised if even those of you who are listening today, don't, don't, don't have an ounce or two of that in your lives. Right. So mm -hmm. cer certainly coming out there. Okay. Jay, I cut you off rudely before. Uh... Yeah on the rhetoric thing and the debate thing. I'm used to it. I'm okay. used to it. But I I'm I, I think it's interesting for people to hear how Scott actually got into debate because it's not a normal, you know, kind of career path or college path that that people go on, right? I mean, normally at that age it's just like, I don't know what I'm gonna be, but tell the story about how you actually get into doing it. Yeah, debate. well it's a, so if I have permission to go a few minutes, there's some length to please interrupt me. Um oh don't worry, Dave but, will uh, I mean clearly <laughs> <laughs> so 
uh, uh, to, to really do the justice here, to understand the trajectory, because to me, it was all about debate, speaking, communicating, how people move others to action. I had an early fascination with how you influence people. Um, and uh, that was, that was uh, coming from, uh, frankly, a really challenging set of circumstances when I was young, really awful circumstances. So if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll take you back to spring of uh, 1987. Yeah, so before college. And uh, I'm a senior in high school, um, really into Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm, I'm mostly getting Ds and Fs with the occasional C on my report card. Um, and that's because I had a really a awful set of early life circumstances. I, When I was uh, nine years old, I never knew my dad. When I was nine years old, my mom left. Um, and we were broke. We were living in a trailer park. So when she left, uh, there was this really confusing and chaotic set of circumstances that had me end up in an intra-family adoption. And uh, a lot, always a lot of chaos and drama around me. We, we would have made awesome guests on the Jerry Springer show, by the way. We, we could have. We would have been a highlight reel for that. Yes. Um, so when it comes time toward graduation, like I'm not even thinking about college, right? right? Um, I wasn't even going to take the SAT, but there was a girl I had a crush on who was taking the SAT, right? And she says, she's going to, and asked me if I was going to. So I'm like, oh, yes, <laughs> yes, I'll be, I will be taking the SAT. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I take it, we, you know, the scores come back and she asked me how I did. And uh, I'm like, oh, I got a 570 and she smiles big and she says, nice. What section? <laughs> and um, it's like, oh. So you get it like I'm I'm in Loserville. I'm not going to college. Um, it became obvious at that moment. It was very poignant on what section. So time out. You get you get yeah. 200 for signing your name and then you got 370 over and above that collectively. Yeah. I mean, that, when it comes to SAT, that's what I did. I sat. I sat. <laughs> um, so I'm, I have no designs on going to college. Right. Um, but those early life circumstances did teach me a lot about how to persuade people, how to influence others, because there were times uh, life was really dicey. So I, I, I think I developed some natural uh, abilities there. Um, I should say not, not developed natural abilities, but cultivated some abilities there over time. If it's if you know you go the ten the what's the ten thousand hour rule by Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah. But by age seventeen, I had ten thousand hours of you know sort of like talking my way into, you know, uh, into getting a decent dinner someplace or, you know, not getting the crap kicked out of me. You know, I, I had lots of persuasion yeah. skill at that time. Right, right, right. And now, and now, and I know we want to get into the debate piece, but, you know, obviously your circumstances were not easy. And, you know, how, how much of what you do today is possible because of what you experienced back then? For example, living in that state of, I don't know that lack of stability, unrest, yeah. not knowing who who I'm gonna who's who my parents are, all those things. Like, how much does that in, impact you today with the work you do, if at all? Well, um, I th I think so much of what I learned about persuading others, leading others, um, how words uh, and ideas can sort of shape what happens in a circumstance. I think every day. Um, certainly sticks with me every day um, in terms of the experience itself. I've I've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in therapy so that it doesn't, but um, but certainly you know an idea of uh, of having a sense that um, how you interact in a set of circumstances can change the outcome. That that's an everyday thing. Yeah, yeah, J Jay. Real quick, just to bring you into it because we're still going to get to the debate piece. What's your take on that? It's not like you grew up in a perfect environment either, nor did I. But obviously, Scott's situation was a little. More yeah, no, well, I mean, yeah, Scott's situation definitely. But I mean, you know, I grew up same thing. I mean, my dad, I grew up in a situation where my mom, uh, quite opposite from Scott, my mom was a powerhouse, right? And so my my growing up, uh, and my dad was not. My dad, alcoholic, you know, I go to the local grocery store, he'd be out, passed out in his truck, you know what I mean? I'd have to bring him home, very embarrassing stuff, right? But so I grew up mm. resenting my mom. Because I wanted my mom, I wanted my dad to be like my mom. You know what I mean? I wanted my dad to be the powerhouse and mom to be mom, you know, and and cook great meals and be cool. But instead, mom was 
you know, powerhouse. So I, I think, you know, you do, sh there's no doubt these things shape you, right? You know, so I, I kind of, anything that drives me, I did get from my mom, but it was not fun. You know, we were not fun to be around my mom and I were growing up because we fought a lot, you know, very stubborn. I'm stubborn. And we fought a lot. And I, again, the root of it was I, I just resented the fact that she had her shit together and my dad didn't, yeah. you know, and it just it was always that thing. Now, years later, I learned that because of that, I am who I am. And fortunately for me, I think I took the best of both of them. You know, my mom's drive and and kind of the the attitude and the mental approach to stuff. And then, you know, but she was tough and harsh. My dad had that demeanor. He was a very, you know, lovable guy. He was the one who made a lot of friends, you know, so that you kind of put those two together and it kind of works. Because if you're just one of those, either one, too much. Is but, yeah. you know, so I think we all take it. We all take, you know, from our childhood, right? I mean, it's how we all get to where we are. And I do think there's something to be said for people who have to go through a lot of adversity young. Right. Because then it's, you know, it's not just handed to you with a silver spoon. You know, you got to fight for everything. Well, yeah. that's the reason I ask. And I think, Scott, to, to have, I want to hear your, I want to hear how debate potentially helped you here. Because at the end of the day, I, a lot of the folks that I work with that run companies, that lead teams, that have somehow figured out a way to make it, didn't come from an obvious success track. And, you know, my experiences were different than yours, but learning how to think quick on my feet or solve problems or to get comfortable with chaos as, as a kid has actually played well and served me as an adult, especially doing the work I do. I'm, so as you, as you stepped into the, you know, debate and rhetoric and all, how did, how did that refine some of what you already, you were already kind of learning those skills naturally. I, I'm, I'm sure this kind of started to refine you or give you a path. Yeah. I, th I think, um, you know, I'm struck by this whole thing, I'll just co comment on it about uh, adversity and uh, having early life adverse circumstances um, that make you learn how to persuade, negotiate, um, you know, deal with chaos around you. I, on the other, on the other side of that, though, I, I just don't. I think that um, so, so many have too much of it. Yeah, and, you know, when you get an overload of that, that then it's then it's too much. Like none of us would want that for our kids to yeah, think yeah. that it's better in any way, even if there are some, um, call it productive or even positive characteristics that come from it. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's only going to be a small percentage that actually get out of that, right? Yeah, and that's right. and they're they're out of it because they've been able to somehow get through it but you're right it's i don't think we all want to artificially create chaos for our kids so that they'll have to you know no. get some adversity yeah. going you no, know what i think is interesting though is somebody believed that you had the potential to potentially pursue this path somebody saw something in you that yeah. you could see right so yeah. take it from there and then yeah and i by the way i i apologize if i meandered on the story and and and, and no. because in a right. different direction here so you know, at this time in my life, I, there, there's no plan for college. Um, there's no plan for much of anything. I mean, I'm, I'm on a fast track for another trailer park. But um, I'm in the speech class in high school. It was the only class I really didn't get bad grades in. And um, the speech teacher, John Davis, says to me, hey, um, come to the county speech competition. It's like next week. Uh, do a couple of the speeches that you've done in class. Because the winners in each category, they get a one semester scholarship, books and tuition to our local community college. And um, and I, I think you've got a chance at this. So I want you to come to the speech competitions next week. And as I, you know, sort of like Scott Edinger circa 1987, uh, I I say yes. I reluctantly say yes. I Of course, it scares the bejesus out of me, the idea of doing this thing. And on the day of the competition, I'm a no-show. You know, I, I just, it's like, I blow it off. No, no, no shock. I probably had an important game of Dungeons and Dragons or something. <laughs> you know, maybe I needed, maybe I needed to listen to an Iron Maiden album for the 978th time. Just had to, you know. So the next day in school, uh, Mr. Davis is not just a little pissed off at me. Like he's, <laughs> he's really angry. Uh, but he lets me know, he's like, there are two scholarships still available. A couple of the kids who won have, uh, plans to go elsewhere and are all taken care of. So uh, I've arranged for you to have a private tryout with the director of forensics. For those of you who don't know what forensics is, that is speech and debate. Uh, everybody often thinks that has something to do with medicine. It, it does also, but... <clears throat> or crime scenes. You know, yeah, that's right. <laughs> speech, yeah, exactly. So um, he says, go 
to her office. Her name's Barbara Williamson. Uh, she's going to give you a tryout. And if you do well, you get a chance to get the scholarship. So I go, this time I do show up. Amazing what happens when you do show up. And she says, okay, Edinger, one semester, books and tuition, you're on. So here I am, I'm going to college. And um, scary time, but exciting. So for my first, for, and then of course, we have six or seven speech tournaments that are on weekends. Every So we're going to these things. And uh, for the first one, I show up to that tournament too, but um, I didn't really prepare. I didn't really give it my all. Have, I'm sure everybody listening here has had those moments where you show up for something, but not really, mm -hmm. right? Like you didn't give it your all, you didn't prepare, you didn't do what you're supposed to. And uh, we have a long drive back uh, to Merritt Island, Florida, where I lived after the tournament, it's quiet. And um, as we're getting out, I'm getting my stuff out of our van. We have a bunch of students in this van. I'm getting my stuff out. She walks over to me and she says, I don't get it, Scott. You, uh, you have this opportunity and you've got some talent to work with. And um, I don't know what you're doing with it. So I was, uh, I was really embarrassed. I was kind of humiliated. Um, but that got to me. And for the first time in my life, I buckled down and I started working on something. Was, uh, like I had never felt this way. And uh, I started writing speeches and practicing. And then we started to go to tournaments and I would start to make the final rounds. And we keep going. And then I started to place. And at the end of that first semester, she said, okay, I'll extend your scholarship. You keep doing this. I will extend the scholarship to allow you to get your two-year associate's degree. And then I started winning. And at the end of my freshman year, almost a year to the date of that speech tournament that I had blown off and, and missed, uh, I was at the national championships competing with students from all over the country, and I got two bronze medals. Wow. And, and, uh, and that sort of paved the way for me to go on and get a university degree, go to a four-year university. Um, I got involved in leadership and, and a, lot, a lot of things on campus. It's really uh, a life-changing trajectory. And things started to fall into place after that. I wouldn't say it got easy, but um, they started to fall into a place like you would expect them to. Yeah. Um, it was a real pivotal time. What, why did you decide to listen to these people or believe these people, given that you didn't have a lot of structure behind you? Yeah, that's a good question, Dave. Um, the way I can put it together now, I wouldn't have then, is that growing up in the sort of miserable circumstances that I did, one thing I knew is that this isn't right. It ought to be different. I've got to figure out a way to make it be different because mm. I don't want this for my life. This is off. Like I did not want that, but I didn't know how to do it. The tough part about growing up in a trailer park for kids who are in bad circumstances is that there's nobody to look to that says, this is how it's done. Here's how you can get there. Right. And that's the worst part of it all. Well, I don't know the worst part of it all. That's one of the really yeah. terrible parts of it all. There's no one else to look to, but when the opportunity was put in front of me, and then I could see, you know, you get to college and you see, oh, there's kids here who are going places and there's, there's paths. There's lots of different paths you can follow, but you got to get on one and follow that. Then I saw that opportunity, had it in front of me, had, risked losing it. And then it's like, okay, we've got to focus. So I think it was that. Right, right. And so just out of curiosity, as it relates to the work you do now, you advise companies, you're a strategic advisor. Do you, you do any coaching as well or no? A lot of it. I would say probably half of my work is working one-on-one -on -one with executives. Okay. Though the, the term executive coach has really only come into vogue in the last decade. There's always okay. advising, consulting. Uh, okay. Prices went up when, it, when executive coaching became cool. Yeah. But um you know, the, the whole idea of working one on one with executives to help them become a more effective leader, uh, more uh, powerful in their communication, more able to drive their business to growth, yeah. more strategic. Th these are the kinds of things I spend a lot of time on. Right. How does your experience going through that, you know, phase where you became a, a you know, a, a talented debater, for example, you, you could you could actually see an end game with that process. How much does that tie to the work you do with a company that wants to grow? You wrote this book, The Growth Leader. Yeah. How how important is it for that leader? I think it's kind of an obvious question to know where they're going. Well, I th 
I think, um, you know, having some strategic perspective about what's the objective or the goal here is uh, is a vital part about that. You know, there, that, there's plenty of content in the book about this. But the real key for me, given the background that we talked about and some of the things we have been discussing here, is the power that we all have as leaders to influence others, to inspire them to do something different, better, more, whatever it is. Um, and to be able to do that in our interactions, how we connect with them, the words we use, uh, the, the way we paint a clear picture and then paint them into that picture in terms of what's possible. Yeah. These are all about leadership. It is all about language, human connection, and a picture of what the future could be. These right. things are, are vital. You put them together. And of course, in the stories I've been um, may, maybe talking too much about, you, you can see all of those elements starting to you know, like a photograph and solution over the last 30 years start to develop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jay, I want to hear your take on this. I mean, Jay and I, I've, you guys have known each other longer than Jay and I. I think we met mm, 15 years ago or so, Jay, somewhere around there. Yep. Uh, but you're the same guy that I met 15 years ago. I mean, s same philosoph philosophies and the way you come across and what you, but the thing you've always talked about, and I think the first time we did a recording was a, a, on uh, trust and belief, but the whole concept of belief Scott, you talk a lot about belief in, in the book. And I've, I listened to a couple of your interviews uh, on Apple with different people. And you, you talk a lot about the importance, not only of believing in yourselves, but uh, yourself, but believing in other people, the cause of the company, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't fully know if people understand the power of that. And you both talk about it a lot. Can you, exp both of you feel free to jump in, but why is belief so important? And what goes through your head when you talk about it? Jay, hit well, that one. I mean, for me, I on the belief side of it, I just think it's people won't do things if they don't believe they need to do it. You know, it's like if someone wants to run a marathon, they're not going to do it unless they really believe they want to do it. You know, I mean, are they motivated to do it? You can't you can't train for something like that if you don't have an internal belief and a drive to go to it. And, you know, running a sales organization, if people don't, believe that they've got to make the calls, they've got to do the metrics, whatever it is that you manage. If they really deep down don't believe that that's going to lead to something else, they're just not going to do it. They'll actually go to great lengths to not do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they'll, they'll come up with all sorts of crazy excuses and reasons why they don't do it. But deep down, they, they don't believe that that activity is going to lead to success for whatever reason. So I, I've always, when I talk to my folks, it's always about trying to understand what do they believe. You know, and, and how is it that we can work that in so we're both benefiting from this belief? But I, I think it's, you know, again, going to the gym, if you don't believe lifting the weights or running on the treadmill is going to get you to where you go, you just kind of half-ass your way through it. Mm -hmm. You know, you just don't really dive into it. That's my take on it. What about you, Scott? Uh, well, first of all, as I don't know that I can say anything more than that. But I'll speak to the leaders who are uh, listening to your podcast, who are building organizations. Uh, in in the growth leader, I say that you know, and you're all trying to build cultures, yeah, um, which is a fuzzy topic. So I'd say you know the, your simple definition here on culture, which is what we're talking about right now, culture are the beliefs that shape behaviors, yeah. So in your organization, what people believe will dictate how they act, what they do, the decisions they make. Yeah. So if you if you think about that and you focus on, well, here's what we believe that we do that is of value. Uh, we talked a lot early on about the connection between sales and leadership. Well, if you think sales is about pushing for a series of transactions, well, then your people will act that way. But if you believe that sales is a valuable part of your customer experience, where you help customers to th or clients to think differently or to see issues that they hadn't considered or opportunities that they hadn't thought about. If you think that that's valuable and you're creating value in the sales experience, well, your people start to behave differently and you treat them that way. So if you consider beliefs that shape behavior as the fundamental ingredient in creating a culture of high performance, what your people believe will reflect what they think is the right thing to do or what they that will drive how they behave because that's what they think is the right thing to do. Call, call it 95% of the time. Most people try to do the right thing. And Scott, I'll go to you first here, but do you guys believe that most organizations know their customers well enough to achieve their growth, go growth goals? 
I think that there are people inside of every organization that do, but generally, no. Why is that though? Why is, why why do you say no? I, I don't disagree with you, by the way. I don't think they spend enough time understanding the subtlety and the nuances of their customers or clients, whatever you're calling them, circumstances. Um, it's sort of like you you've seen that you've seen each movie, so you skim through parts of it. It's like you've I've seen this before. I know exactly what's going on here. Um, and you're right about part of it. That's part of the problem. But there's lots of things that we miss. And it's those things that we miss that are often the difference between winning and losing the business uh, that's most important to you. And I also think it's hard. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, you to build relationships, to go out there and do what you need to do to really understand, you know, your client, whatever your client is. Um, it's not easy. And, and again, it's belief. You know, like I do think sometimes the the leaders don't necessarily believe they have to. Mm. They think other people can do that, you know, mm. and then they lose the, the longer that goes, the farther away they get to truly understanding what's going on in their in their client base. But it, it is also it's it's tough to do. You got to go. You got to get out there. You know, you got to meet people. You got to have lunches and the dinners and you got to kind of, you know, be vulnerable so you can be a human being. So you can really get to know, you know, who your clients are. And And I think it's hard. And I think some people just are not interested in doing that. And they don't believe that they have to, you know, they think other people can do that. Back to your point, Scott, if lead, if the top person doesn't really believe that, then how effective is everyone else going to be down the chain? Yeah. You know? And how important for me, it always comes down to the people. Like who are the people inside of this organization? Who's leading this show and who have they hired to support this initiative you could you could have the greatest strategy and plan and marketing this or that it if you don't have people that actually understand what it takes to execute and you talk about this in the book it really doesn't matter i could have the greatest of offensive or defensive game plan if i've got the wrong players on the field or they don't take care of themselves or they show up late you know or they don't understand what the defense is doing you know so so how important I think about when I read your book, I, I read it and I said, wow, there's, there's not much in this book that I don't believe. I read it and I say, this is spot on. I always get concerned when I'm in front of an organization. I want to know, are you actually committed to doing something about what you say you want to do? Are you actually prepared to move on from people or change the dynamic with your customer? Do you have the courage to do that? Or is it just going to sit in some BS plan? What's your, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think to pull that thread of belief further through this series of topics, there it's sort of like I get asked this question a lot. What's the one thing, right? What's the one thing leaders should, you know? And it's like, it's a frustrating question because, of course, I got to come up with a good answer and a different one. I can't just... So um, the truth behind that is that if you're going to succeed on so many of these kinds of endeavors, certainly everybody listening to this organization or to this podcast is leader of an organization trying to build something toward growth. However, you're measuring that growth, net income, number of customers, profit, whatever it is, you're trying to grow. There are a lot of things that you have to be able to do differently or effectively. Um, and it's not enough to just do a couple of them. You'd said, you know, you get a great strategy, great product, but if we fall down in sales experience, well, then we lose a quarter of the decision criteria. You can read about that in chapter two. But there's, <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many things that you need to be attentive to as an executive. How do you take five or six of them and make the commitment that you were talking about because you believe we do these things well, we will succeed. And you've got to keep revisiting that. I think there is a belief that um, you have to have, again, there's that word again, do we have the belief that if we do these things well, we will succeed? And are you right? You got to keep testing that. Mm -hmm. I remember, uh, Jay, I, I don't know if you remember this, but I it was right after you and I first met, I invited you to a training. This was back in a previous life and you were nice enough to come to it. And I had never stood in front of a room before. And the person who ran the organization left that day and said, you're going to be running the afternoon and it was it was like a three hour session with a group of people jay being one of them with me and at the time i had never stood in front of a room alone i had never taught anybody anything in a formal way and i'm thinking to myself how am i going to do this i had no belief in myself standing up in front of that room and for whatever reason 
you sat there as did everybody else and you listened and i still to this day wonder why well there were locks on the door stay we couldn't leave i mean well that's (laughs) true that's true i did lock everybody in i do have a question for you though I, I'm fascinated by the whole process of writing, and you've probably had these ideas in your head for years. To your point, back to when you were probably in, you know, yep. early twenties. What what caused you to actually take on the the you know the whole journey of writing a book, and did it turn out the way you expected it to? Um, I'll answer the last one first. Yeah, it did turn out the way I expected it to. Okay, why do it? Apparently I'm a masochist and I <laughs> let, <laughs> because the, this book, and I've written two other books with co-authors. This is the first one I did on my own. Yeah. Um, and it took five years, three full on rewrites, like the first two completely scrapped. And the last one was completely eviscerated before we, you know, got to a final version of it. And it was really hard for me. I have notes that go back to this, my first notes in the file for the book research are back to 2014. So wow. nine years before publication. And I do think that the ideas for this started at that lunch that I was talking about there, because the connection between leadership and strategy and sales is missing for so many. And I had a career in sales for 15 years uh, as an individual contributor and EVP of sales a couple of different times. And I was a frustrated sales leader working with CEOs who did not get it. And then when I've been into consulting and um, my consulting has been around leadership and strategy and sales, whenever I would talk with leaders in the C-suite who were trying to grow their business and working on their strategy, it was devoid of any connection to field reality where it would all happen. So I have been frustrated, frankly, pissed off about this topic for, you know, at least a couple of decades. Yeah. So I, and that's part of why it was so hard to write because I'd lean too far into leadership where I spent lots of years of my career. I'd lean too far into strategy and then it'd get too heady. Then it'd get too tactical. And I'm talking about, so it took a long time to hit the right notes to be able to integrate those three. And by the way, when all of you read it, I sure hope you will. Um, (laughs) You'll see that. You'll see the struggle in the book because it's not a perfect book. I know all its flaws. Um, so you'll see that. But the message turned out, frankly, exactly as I wanted it to. That yeah. growth for an organization is a leadership issue, not a sales issue. Who were you writing to? Did you, When you were writing, and I'm sure it was many people over the yeah. years, were you internalizing? I'm writing this to you, you son yeah. of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, you've got it, man. Uh-huh. Um, there's about a half a dozen people that, um, Frank, I, I could name them because they didn't <laughs> hire me, <laughs> um, that I think just did not get it, yeah. you know, like, and they're CEOs, senior executives in big companies. And oh. then I interviewed about 30 CEOs for the research for the book. So all of those voices are the people who like, and there's a handful of the CEOs there. We named them in the book, the ones who got it. Right, right, right. Have good yeah. stories. There's a half a dozen of them, but the preponderance really didn't. So it's like I was writing to them to say, "Wake up and smell the coffee, man." Yeah. I'm still waiting for my call, though. You never called me. I you never consulted <laughs> with me. Am I going to make the second book? Like, what? How do, how does that work? Um, you, you're uh, you're featured <laughs> uh, when I write the next one, which will, might be never. <laughs> so jay and i were at where were we at up in was it 110 grill i forget the name of the place we were at a restaurant when? and you were telling me about scott's book and that i would get a copy of his book which by the way scott i read every single page and i've got i don't know Thank how you. many of them flagged and i have my notes in there so it, it's been completely Thank re- you. oh you're very welcome and the same of all of your listeners <laughs> i have i have read every book of, of of a person that i've interviewed i've done that um but Jay said that when he was reading it, all he heard was your voice. And now that I know you, oh. if I read it again, I'll just I'll just hear your voice. But Jay, what what was uh, what's your take on what Scott had to say in the book? Like what what resonated with you the most? Without getting into the, all the specifics, was there a takeaway that you think people are going to want to hear? Yeah, I mean, I really do think it's the what we've been talking about, which is you know the leaders of these organizations really don't get the importance of what sales really is and how important it is for them to be in front of their customers, you know, and, and just understanding, you know, what the landscape is and they can't just hide behind spreadsheets and P and L's and look inward. Right. I, I think a lot of senior executives, whatever, look inward a lot, you know, and they're not outward 
facing and they're not talking to the customers and really getting an understanding of what's going on in their particular environment or whatever field they're in, you know, and that struck me. And then the sales, the sales strategy piece I, is also one where I think a lot of companies struggle with that. You know, I mean, I know like the customers I have, I mean, their sales strategy might be just make a lot of phone calls. I mean, that might be it, right. <laughs> you know, like these are the target clients yeah. and call a bunch of them, you know? So I, and that, you know, that's not a strategy. So I think, you know, I think that's hard. That's hard for companies to really understand. Like people have mission statements and vision statements and they do all these crazy things, but do they really understand what their sales strategy is? Because in my opinion, I think a lot of that, when we talk, when I talk to my clients about sales strategy, it's not really strategy. They're talking no. about like, the metrics or the activity that leads, but they don't exactly know where it's leading to. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was I was happy when Jay, because Jay, you shared that comment with me that you could hear my voice in it. This was hard. Yeah, for, yeah, I, I was, I was it say- was really freaky to be honest with you. I needed to get you out of my head. I had to like go to <laughs> you know, counseling afterwards because it's the first time you're the first time I read a book that I knew the author. You yeah. know, and it was you know normally when I'm reading, it's my own voice. It was you and. And I could see, because I've known you for so long, I literally was listening to you talk to me as you were reading, as I was reading the book, it was you talking, I could hear you talk. It was, it was actually strange. Like I even felt the inflections when you would normally inflect, because again, I've heard you speak for 30 years and it was really like an audio book for me, even though I was reading it, it was kind of crazy. So that, that um, comment is important to me because that was part of what was so hard in the writing to Dave's question. And um for the first two years of writing it, I was writing it constantly revising things, constantly changes those because I could hear those CEOs say, Oh, they're not they're gonna disagree with that. They're gonna challenge me on that. They're going to and and whether they're right or wrong didn't matter. It's like I just didn't want to be um sort of like disagreed with by some of these and and I really had to get to the point where I was like, I'm gonna put my stake in the ground. I have good rationale for it. I believe this. You may not like it. Uh, it may piss some people off. It may be counter to what somebody at McKinsey might write. Or, you know, I had all of these fears uh, about how it would be perceived. And it wasn't until that I could until I could deal with that and say, I'm going to write it the way I want to write it. And then let's see what happens. That That's when the book started to flow. That's what resonated with me. As I read it, all I kept thinking was, this guy's telling the truth. He's telling the truth, whether you want to accept it or not. This is what it comes down to. You can face it or not face it. It doesn't make a damn bit of difference. This is the truth. You know, it's just it's just like diets and exercise. You eat this way, you'll be better off than you won't. Than if you eat that way. <laughs> if you exercise, you'll be better off than if you don't. OK, I mean, it is what it is. You can face it or not. Um, yeah. I, and and in the writing, I was so so that's what I wanted to do. But I was so worried. Do I ha- does the research back it up? And I'd have this complex. I'd be like, oh, that's only 25 interviews in that research study, or this research isn't my original research. I got to take it from someplace else. So all of these things about proving my case, Mm. I had to say, this is enough. I'm going to say it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you did. I I, I felt it through and through. It's almost like because our worlds are somewhat parallel, I'm reading it like, yep, you don't, you, you could have had no, no references. And I would have said, that's the truth. That's the truth. Just it's lived experience with me. So I thought you did a great job with that. Um, Real quick, uh, a a real critical question. The King's Duck Inn in Merritt Island, Florida is, is no longer in existence, correct? I don't know the King's Duck Inn, but I don't like as much as I grew up in Merritt Island, Florida. Um, it sounds like I might, when I was growing up there, I might not have been going to the King's Duck Inn, yeah. but, uh, and, but I go back and go, like, uh, it's not ringing a bell for me. Well, you're a better person for it. I lived down there. I, I lived, I think I told you <laughs> yeah, yeah. pre, pre uh, recording or whatever. I lived in Cape Canaveral, Canaveral, Florida briefly. Right. And I worked with a woman who th- th- this is where she and her husband would go. And I would go there. It was on bar rescue in 2014 it was really in trouble and i I, for some reason i don't think it exists anymore but you're a better man for having not gone to the place so (laughs) anyway uh, i know you have a uh, 10 30 i only have two minutes and i don't want to abuse your time jay scott i I can make somebody wait a little bit longer this is important Uh, uh, okay okay well what haven't we covered that you think that that, what do you want to weigh in on that we haven't covered because i know we've been kind of all over the place here we have covered it but we haven't covered it with the term i'll use here Uh, We've talked about the importance of the beliefs that shape behavior and that you as a leader, I'm talking directly to your listeners here, right? Like you're all listening, trying to get better as a leader. Um, 
the way you connect with people and the way you, uh, my research on inspiring leadership would say that the number one thing you can do is to make an emotional connection with people. And I always go out of my way. I'm not talking to, to clarify when I say that. I'm not talking about wild displays of emotions or excessive emotionality or getting into group therapy, um, but rather connecting with people like people, not task-focused robots. And if you do that and you have the right set of beliefs around what's successful for your organization and what works for you, you'll make a difference and you have a greater impact as a leader than you probably realize. Mm. Well, there's so much truth to what you just said. I mean, the emotional piece is such a confusing topic for a lot of people. Sure. Emotion. I've seen people confuse sympathy with empathy. I've seen people like yell and scream thinking that's going to motivate when really maybe just a sharp comment might. Uh, or they over disclose. I think you I think you spoke about this in, in your book where the relationship is now based on over disclosing like a therapy session or a gossip right. session. Any any thoughts on that? I mean, people get that confused all the time. Well, again, I, th I think this idea of how we connect, um, whether it's around it, it, it's not about oversharing or um like, you know, group therapy or even excessive emotionality. Like nobody expects you to be the energizer bunny and a cheerleader. Um, but but you, you need to have some energy and some enthusiasm. Of course, nobody's like that all the time. Otherwise, you're fake. You're not being genuine. So uh, there's a real power in anger in leadership. Of course, not exploding on people like a volcano, right. but the really good leaders on this can get behind the anger instead of just getting angry with someone. They can talk with them about, I'm concerned about this. I'm frustrated about, I'm worried about this. I'm fearful that this is the outcome. So this is an emotion you can connect on with others. Your willingness to invest in the development and growth in others. You know, um, when I ask people, tell me about the most inspiring leader, the person who connected most with you, it, they inevitably tell me a story about how someone helped them to grow, got them better. So there's a lot of ways to do this. That's not just excessive emotion right? It's about connecting. Uh, like, I wish there was an, I almost wish, I'd say almost, that there was another way to describe this. It's like connect as human. It sounds, it's sort of like common sense, but not common practice. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's what I'm talking about when I write about inspiring leadership and how that's done. Yeah. And I will say my comment on that is I think it's never been more important than now, right? Because oh, yeah. COVID has just screwed everything up with people's ability and want to even leave the house you know i mean it really you think about where we've been for the last four years <clears throat> you know you just it, it's nowhere near what it used to be from a you know interaction standpoint now it's you know the zoom and what we're doing here is fine but it's not yeah. the same as actually having lunch with somebody right or or meeting someone out and doing something face to face and there's so much of this work from home and you know decentralized work environments and stuff where you know people aren't they're they're really sacrificing this piece in my opinion yeah. i think it's just it's not happening nearly as much as it did and it wasn't happening enough back then let alone even yeah now. i just i i do want to if i may we don't have a lot of time left but i do want to challenge one thing on that just for the listeners to think about here yeah um you can have really powerful and strong relationships where you're not physically in the same place and and i don't discount the power of getting together and having the lunch or the dinner or whatever, uh, I would say it is you can you can still do it well if you're intentional about it. If you are not multitasking, if you are if you're bringing yourself to that conversation with a desire to say I am interested in nothing else but this conversation and making it useful, powerful, valuable, a, a chance to do that. You can do that in Zoom just the same. You know, in I won't I stop myself from saying just the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do it very effectively. And I've seen lots of great relationships develop, grow, and thrive, even with people who have never met in person. So uh, you'll never catch me saying it's not valuable, it's not awesome, it doesn't help. But I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to lean on it as a crutch. You, you can still do it. One other thing, and maybe this is a podcast for a different day, but it and I, and we can't talk about it at length right now, but I always think about, especially especially over the last few years in coaching lots of people is I learned, I've learned a lot about people that I probably would have never learned 
had the pandemic not happened. And when it comes to connection, I think in order to really truly build a genuine connection with somebody else, you've got to be really clear about who you are and who you're not, you know, good, bad, and, and, and otherwise, because if, if you're not good with yourself, it's going to be really hard for somebody else to feel a connection with you. So I've got to, yeah. I've got to come to you fully, like, this is what I am and what I'm not and what I'm working yeah. on and where I've been in order for you to feel comfortable enough to be that way with me. Yeah. I mean, Pete, I, I'd say, you know, people are like animals. They can s sniff out what, you know, what's real and what's not. It yeah. may take some longer, but people will tell if you're not being genuine. No, it's so true. It's so true. All right, guys, Scott, I want to, I want to be respectful of your time. Yeah, is there thank you. any, I'll give you the last word. You guys both have, Jay, do you have a last word? And then Scott, you have a last word. And then I'll, then I'll stop recording. I'd Word say, uh, ho ho oh, hope, you, hope you enjoy the growth lead. Hmm? <laughs> oh, you're going to get the last word. I'm second right. to last. I get the last uh, word. Hope you enjoy the growth leader. You can find me, scottedinger.com. I make a, a, a living being easy to find on the interwebs. Uh, you can find me there. I hang out on LinkedIn too. Hope you enjoy the book. Thank you, Scott. All right, now I get the final, final. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, look, I was going to say from 570 on the SAT to best-selling uh, author, it's quite the... Uh, <laughs> quite the ride and i've been along for it for 30 plus years so you know you're one of my best friends on yeah. the planet and i will say i'm very proud of you to write this book man because i knew i know how hard it was uh you yeah. know especially the rewrite stuff so it's a great book and uh proud of you man oh thank you jay it's mutual brother guys thank you very much let's do it again yeah great take care